Whoever the fuck you name on the planet Earth was at that funeral. Like Lauren Hill, Mary, whoever on Earth. And I remember when I walked in there, like people started crying, hugging me and shit, like because they knew my relationship with them. Well, of course, LL was there and um, Nick Cannon. Chris used to manage Nick. Fifty was there. Puffy was there. There's so many people. My brother was well loved. There's so many people. All these people were gathered at the Frank E. Campbell Funeral Chapel in Manhattan. That's the same place where funerals for stars like Aaliyah, Luther Vandross, and the notorious B.I.G. were held. If you were on the street outside that day, you might have thought this was a red carpet event. Celebrities stepping out of SUVs with blacked out windows. Paparazzi were there too, looking for a spot to take the perfect shot. Bodyguards did their best to hold them back. But inside there was no award show, no new album dropping, just a casket holding the body of a man named Chris Lighty just a few days earlier has shocked the world. The medical examiner has ruled the death of hip-hop mogul Chris Lighty is a suicide. Lighty was found with a gunshot wound to the head at his Bronx home on Thursday. Police say they found a black handgun at the scene, but no note. The 44-year-old worked with some of rap and R&B's biggest stars, including New York acts LL Cool J, Mariah Carey, Sean Diddy Combs, and 50 Cent. Chris also worked with Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, Foxy Brown, Q-Tip, he signed some of the biggest endorsement deals in the history of hip-hop. This guy was a king and a kingmaker, which is why no one saw this coming. Powerful black men like Chris Lighty do not shoot themselves. It makes no sense. Not when he fought and thought his way out of the hood. Not when he beat the odds and didn't end up in jail. And certainly not when he achieved so much, contributed so much to the culture, and made so much damn money along the way. But somehow... There he was, lying in a casket with a bullet through his skull. Here's Chris's mom, Jessica, reading the eulogy she wrote for her son. My son was the eldest of six children, born in the Bronx, New York. From a very young age, he was encouraged to be independent, dependable, loyal and true to his family and friends. He lived that way throughout his short but eventful life. He leaves a legacy that his children can cherish and use as a benchmark in defining what makes a person successful in life. It was not the fame, the material possessions, nor even the love of a career he enjoyed every day of his adult life. It was much deeper than that. My son was a lover of God, family, friends, and life itself. And as we all do along life's journey, he made some wrong turns, but he never wavered in that love. <laughs> Sleep well, my son. We all love you so much. Gimlet Media and the Loudspeakers Network. I'm Reggie Osei, and this is Mogul, the life and death of Chris Light. The story you're about to hear is about the birth of hip hop and the birth of a hip hop legend. But it's also about the darker side of the industry and a lot of shit that people in our world would rather not talk about. It's the story how Chris Lighty, a young kid from the Bronx, managed to rise so high, and how, when he got there, everything went so fucking wrong. To really understand Chris Lighty and hip hop, we have to go back to where they both came from the Bronx. Chris was born in 1968, he came up in the 1970s, a time when New York City was fucked up. Most of the wealthy and middle class had fled, taking their tax dollars with them, leaving the city borderline bankrupt. 
And of all the boroughs, the Bronx was easily the most fucked up. Crime skyrocketed. Employment plummeted. Gangs with names like the Black Spades, Savage Skulls, and the Sedgwick Sisters patrolled the streets. And there was an outbreak of fires throughout the borough. The Bronx was burning, literally. All of this was happening right outside Chris Lighty's front door. But kids are kids. No matter where they grow up, they go outside and they play. Here's Chris's sister, Nicole. What's your earliest memory of Chris? <laughs> my earliest memory? Oh, my brother. <sighs> so many. Riding our bikes on Stickney Place in the Bronx. <laughs> oh, we had to be in the house when those lights came on. But we would just ride our purple bikes up and down the street. Oh, man, memories. Was he fearless on his bike? No, he made us fearless. He was our oldest brother. We had to do all the dirty work. <laughs> he put us up to it. And we did it, of course. We trusted him. But we played a lot. It was six of us. We did childhood stuff in an environment where you wasn't allowed to really have a childhood. And we made sure we had one. One of the reasons they could have such a normal childhood in such a tough environment was because of Chris's mom, Jessica. She did her best to insulate her kids from what was happening in the Bronx. She kept them in solid, working-class neighborhoods. They went to church every Sunday. And she sent them to the best schools, which in Chris's case were white schools. And I remember when he was maybe eighth grade, and he said to me, Ma, why do I have to go to that school? He was the only black person in there, and because he would have to fight. And I would tell him, you are a black, you're a male, and you have to not be just as good as them. You have to be better than them if you're going to succeed. That's why you have to go to those schools. Chris may have gone to a fancy school, but at the end of the day, he always had to come back to his own neighborhood. And in that environment, being book smart was not enough. You had to be street smart. And you needed a crew, so you always had somebody to watch your back. Yeah, you know, everybody had their little gang, right. you know. In certain areas, like, you had to be in a crew so you could move around, because if not, you would get bullied or picked on or whatever the case may be. And, you know, walking through projects like this, you know, every time you had to prove yourself. That's Daryl Thompson. He and Chris met when they were a little older, freshmen in high school. Yeah, what, what high school did you guys go to? Samuel Gompers, Gompers okay. Stompers. Once again, Gompers stand up, graduates 86, yes. And from then on, they were inseparable. You know how you get to somebody and you talking to somebody and y'all go back and forth? And sometimes you don't even have to talk, but you round that person and you already know, yo, that's my boy forever. Right. That's it. Right. And that's how me and Chris was. Something the pair shared was a love of fly gear. This was huge for kids growing up in the inner city. Definitely for me. And that's a big part of why I'm so drawn to Chris Lighty's story. In some ways, Chris and I live parallel lives. We both grew up in New York City around the same era, Chris in the Bronx and me in Brooklyn. And like so many city kids, we fell in love with the hip-hop culture that was starting to take shape around us. We dedicated our lives to this. Chris became one of the most powerful men in the industry. While I spent over a decade as a successful music attorney, we ran in similar circles, made a few deals together, both made names for ourselves, but deep down, we were still kids from the neighborhood trying to stay fresh. When I met with Dow, that's exactly what we bonded over. We didn't have much growing up, so whatever we had, we had to keep clean. Like, I had a pair of Adidas. $54.99, right? Yes. $54. $54.99. Went to Frank's on Park Avenue in the Bronx in Tremont. Park Avenue, Tremont. Favorite spot. And there was a spot called Jew Man. Jew Man. Yeah. Jew Man, the fame mm -hmm. Jew Man, which is where everyone went from uptown and, and Harlem to get fresh. Yep. What was the color scheme, man? What was, 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 was it white on what? White on black? I had the white on white joints. That's the white on white. Yeah, I had the white on white. So when I cleaned it, like I said, when we, we, we never had much. So what we did is we cleaned everything. I had my toothbrush. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. The whitener, the, remember the, the whitener, the, right, you, you right. put on the whitener when it was all fucked right. up. Right, when, you know when, when it was the, yellow. Because that's, when, you, when you put the white on, the Adidas would look like some zombies, exactly. man. Exactly, and then, you know, the stripe. 
Yeah. You couldn't put the white on the stripe, so you had to clean it with the toothbrush, mm -hmm. and then while it was still a little damp, you put powder on it. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's See, how you kept it white. My first pair, <laughs> my first pair was was, was 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 green on white. Wow. So I had white with the green stripes. Oh. So it was, you know, that was ill, man. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, man. yeah, that's what it is. We like to stay clean. It was a sense that because we didn't have much, what we owned was worth so much more. Clothes, sneakers, watches. Whatever you had, you wanted to show it off. To say to the world, I may not come from a fancy place, but at least I have fresh sneakers on. I'm clean. I'm fly. The problem was that if you did show off what you had, you were putting yourself at risk because people might try to jack it from you. You go to your friend's house, you got to make sure you don't have the right, uh, you know, anything clean on because if you don't, if you have something clean on, you got to fight the people that's there. People are going to rob you. One dude asked me, he said, what's your size? Shoe size? Or? Yeah. And I said, why? He said, because I like your sneakers. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? They had to fight for everything back in the days. The biggest thing for children and for parents, the challenge for parents was um, y you work hard to, to provide uh, decent clothing and shoes and coats for your kids. You do not want to have your children experience being held up at gunpoint and told to strip because they want to take what your kids have, you know. And that was a challenge that every parent faced back then. That happened to Chris? Yeah, it did. Once. I don't know if you've heard this story, but yeah, one of the one of the things that he bought when he was 17 years old was that bomber jacket. The jacket Nicole's referring to was Lighty's pride and joy, a black leather bomber, kind of like the one Tom Cruise wore in Top Gun. Bombers were essential to being fly. We all wanted one, but they were fucking expensive. You'd have to get an after-school part-time job and save up the money to cop one, or some of the kids, they just said fuck it and laid in the cut and wait until cats like us bought our bomber jackets and then they robbed us. And one day, while he was walking home, this is exactly what happened to Chris. And he came home furious. And I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Yeah, he was furious and just grabbing anything to go attack them with. But, you know, it was definitely a turning point for you to be doing the right thing and still someone do something wrong to you kind of takes that innocence away, you know, or puts a pinch of um, reality, I guess, that you don't really want to be a part of. I mean, you know, no one wants to be violated, you know, ever. It takes something from you, and you don't want that to happen. So, yeah, I would have to say that that was his first and last of being violated. Yeah, I would have to say that. One thing that keeps coming up in this story of Lighty's childhood, no matter how much his mom tried to protect him, he was surrounded by violence. He was out on the streets where the rule was if you want something, you take it. And it's not like his home was a place of sanctuary either. Chris's father left when he was six years old, and when his mother remarried, her new husband was physically abusive. He hit her, sometimes in front of the kids. For a while, it got so bad that Chris was sent away to live with a relative. And that was for his safety, because he was now of a size and an age that he could challenge my ex-husband. And I knew I had to leave, but I had not figured out how I was going to be able to leave yet. With all of the chaos on the streets and inside his home, Chris needed an escape, a place where he could get away from all of this shit. But if you're an inner city kid, there aren't that many outlets. You can play basketball, handball, read comic books, or get into trouble. But Chris, he threw himself into music. Man, I remember when Chris got his first boombox, silver boombox, about this big. Oh, my goodness. Double cassette, you know, you had to have that. Yeah, that was a big deal. That boombox was a big deal. <laughs> Early 1980s, those were the years of the boombox. Remember those? Big-ass radio tape players that we carry around blasting the latest songs. 
They were so synonymous with the streets that people called them ghetto blasters. We had dance contests in the house, all of that. Oh, it was great. I have a twin brother, you know, Mike, me and Mike are twins. And uh, Michael was the break dancer, so we did everything from the cardboard box on the floor. But yeah, yeah, Chris and his boom box, oh, that boom box. Man, I don't even know when he got rid of that. <laughs> but it was that was a big part of our childhood. What the ladies were doing here was a little kid version of something that they were seeing right outside of their window. Across the city, DJs hooked up turntables and speakers to lampposts and would spin records in parks, courtyards, handball courts, anywhere there was a space for a crowd. We called them park jams. And it was at these park jams that what we know today as hip hop was born. Coming up after the break, Chris falls in love with hip hop. Welcome back to Mogul. So, back when Chris Lighty was a kid, hip-hop music didn't sound too much like it does today. We're talking pre-Sugar Hill Gang hip-hop, over a decade before N.W.A. hit the airwaves and before Kanye West was even born. Nowadays, when we think of hip-hop, we think of rappers. But back then, rappers were sidekicks. Everything was about the music, and the DJs controlled that. They were the stars. And the DJs that played the park jams were masses of rocking the crowd, keeping people dancing for as long as possible. One of the first to play this new sound was a DJ called Cool Herc. Today, he's known as one of hip-hop's founding fathers. But back then, he was just this tall, cock diesel kid from Jamaica who loved funk and soul records. Here's hip-hop journalist Dan Charnas talking about Herc's great innovation. The incredible Bongo Band um, did this remake of this song originally performed by an English group from the 1960s called The Shadows. The song was called Apache. This was one of Herc's trademark records, right? And the Incredible Bongo Band remade this song with several incredible instrumental breaks. The break part is where there's no lyrics, just instrumentals, just pure percussion. It's ideal to dance to. Herc would never let anybody see what this record was. Like, his job was to find these records and play them. And the boys who came to listen to this stuff and dance to it, right, this was like their favorite jam, and they would wait for that instrumental break to come. Now we get to the invention, right? So Herc begins to realize that the dancers go crazy on these instrumental parts, the breakdowns that come up two minutes into a song, three minutes into a song. Is there a way, he asked himself, that I could just take those little bits that everybody likes and extend them, right? or just go from break to break to break. So the first invention was the merry-go-round. He would just go from the break section of Apache to the break section on Bongo Rock to the break section on Give It Up or Turn It Loose. But then, after that, He got the idea to do two copies of the same record so he could take the break section on Apache and crossfade right into the break section for Apache and keep it going and going and going from the left turntable to the right, back to the left, so that that 10-second breakdown could become this 10-minute beatdown. That was the invention of hip-hop. So remember, Chris and Dow were just kids when Cool Herc started spinning at park jams. But by the time they were teenagers, hip-hop music as we know it was starting to take shape. And now, rather than watching from their bedroom windows, the boys were right there in the mix. 
Here to break down exactly what it was like to attend a park jam, we have Daryl, plus Chris's cousin, A.B. Butler, and his friend, Joan Morgan. Okay, we're in the schoolyard. They put the DJ right there in the front, and they made sure that they're close to that lamppost because they need the electricity to keep the music going and making it loud. So they they taken a long extension cord, and they put it into that lamppost. So it was so crazy how you used to steal electricity back in the days from the lamppost. So you would hear there was a jam in the park and you would just go. It's about six o'clock, they start setting up. Then the music come on and then you start hearing the music a little bit. So now everybody's like, oh, the jam is starting. People run upstairs, put on their good stuff because, you know, you got the girls in there now. So now you want to make sure you're cute. So you go in there, you put on your new leather, green leather jacket or you put on your new Pumas. Back in the days, I will be wearing heels, flare leg leaves, with my name graffiti down the side. Sweetie's knits, it's pants that, you know, different kinds. You got the rainbows. <laughs> and like a name belt buckle. You got the mock necks, you got the bomber jackets, you got the, you know, it's just, wow. You know, you put on a ring or a watch if you got it, or put on your kazals or your, your, your Kango cap or whatever it was you had that lo- made you look good. And that's how you came out with you and your friends. And this was one of the best things. You could drink. <laughs> you had a brown bag or you had a 40 ounce or a 32 ounce. Oh, pink champagne. Pink champagne. Old English. Oh, English. That's how it started. Hip-hop, you got weed in the air, outside. You listening to these DJs mix these records that you never heard before. And the way they mixed it is in tune. It's like sounding like one long record. They scratching and then they got this next beat coming in. It's like, oh my God, I'm loving it. Don't forget you had to break dance. Bring the cardboard boxes out. Start break dancing or you doing an electric boogie. Um, oh. We do the WAP, we do the Pee Wee Herman. You might know how to do the Pee Wee Herman. Chris would do that. he do all the dance. You know, we was young. Get busy, y'all. Get busy, y'all. You locking and you popping and you moving at the same time and you moving and you got your muscles pushing and you got your shoulders moving and you moving your head one way and then you moving your head the other way. Crazy. It's free. You ain't got to come out your pocket. Nobody felt that they was better than anybody else and it wasn't corporate America wasn't involved with it. To me, that was hip-hop. I loved it. I can listen to that one all day. That joint is crazy. Me and, and Chris Lighty, we love that beat. That beat right there. Chris and Dow were children of hip-hop. They were there for its birth. They played in the same parks where it was created. They grew up together, and like them, Hip-hop changed as it got older. If the park jams in the 1970s were the childhood phase, the culture started to reach adolescence in the 1980s. That's when the music started to migrate from the park jams to the Manhattan club scene, and so did they. Chris and Dow's favorite spot to go to and hear the latest hits was a Manhattan nightclub called Union Square. Tell the listeners, man, how um, Union Square looked. Can you describe it? I think I still can. When you first walk in, there was a curtain, so you couldn't even look inside the club. You're on the top floor, and when you walk in, the top floor drapes around the first floor. It's like you're looking down onto the dance floor in Union Square. Just to see how it filled up so quickly. After, say, about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, everybody's coming in at 10.30. That place is packed. That's a sight to see. He didn't know it at the time, but this was the start of something big. It was here at Union Square that Chris would take his first step into the music industry. He'd go from being a fan to becoming a part of the scene. And the man that could make all of this possible, this dude right here. 
Prop Master, Uncle Red, the bum. The bum. Why the bum? Bum, B-U-M, stand for Black Ultimate Man. Okay, the Black Ultimate Man. Okay. Yeah. And the last and the latest right now is the, the coolest legend. But most people know him as DJ Red Alert. Red was one of the DJs at Union Square. He got inspired to DJ when he started going to block parties and park jams in the Bronx. He looked at the guy spinning there and said to himself, I can do that. So he assembled his own record collection and started spinning. After a few years, he built a reputation for being one of the hottest DJs in New York City and even got his own radio show on KISS FM. Don't touch that dial. We're jamming with Red Alert on 98.7 KISS FM. For kids like us, Red Alert was major. He's one of the handful of DJs playing hip-hop on the radio in New York City. If you wanted to hear the hottest new shit, you had to catch a show. Yeah. Then in 1986, Red started spinning at Union Square. When I started the first night, a couple fellas from the Bronx came on down. There was Chris along with Darryl. It was about maybe four or five of them all together. The young men had a proposition for Red. They'd look out for the DJ and make sure no one fucked with him. They'd be his muscle. And in return, they wanted to get in the club for free and all of the perks that came with hanging out with a star like Red. Red did need muscle, but not how Chris and Darrell imagined. Red was like, y'all want to get in? Y'all need to carry these crates. <laughs> so Those crates? They were filled with Red's entire record collection. This was the mid-1980s, remember. Music was not digitized back then. So a DJ like Red Alert would have to carry all of his vinyl from show to show unless he had some industrious kids who were willing to do it for him. These crates was like 30, 40, 50 pounds each, full of records. We had to carry two awful. each. They were metal crates. They wasn't the, and there were some metal crates and some like, what's that? The milk crates. Yeah, the yeah, the plastic too, but them joints was heavy. It's because of course the DJ is not supposed to carry his own crates. Of course not, why? Yeah. Well, why when you got us? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how, he get those crates downtown. You know, I'm thank God that we had somebody that had a truck, cause the bot that the back of the truck was always low, cause that's how many records he had. Those crates had that. It's like he was almost doing a wheelie walk going down the block, cause that's how it was. He had a he had many records. Still, the job, if you could call it that, had its perks. In fact, it totally changed the young men's experience of going to the club. Before they were nobodies, but now that they were down with red. Now they were somebodies. Yeah, when you were um, a regular person paying to get in, you getting online, but you know, running with Red, pay who? Pay what? Nah. Staying online when? Never that. We never got online. As soon as Red come, all of us rock, um, walk up and we get to the front and they see us. Oh, Red, who you got? Red. How did it feel with all those eyes on you? It felt good because everybody's looking. You know, they like, who the hell are them guys? And then, you know, we started making a little name for ourselves throughout the the underground. Because the underground is always talking. Chris and Dow were young. They were brash and they were handsome. And they wanted to capitalize on that. When they saw a girl they liked, they were not afraid to spit game. Regardless of whether she was alone or not. And that was a dangerous game to play in a club like Union Square. If that girl that you're talking to came with a stick-up kid from Brooklyn or a drug dealer from Queens, you were going to have a problem. But Chris and his crew didn't give a fuck. When you walk into Union Square, we were sitting right there waiting for those girls to come in. Now, if they were some guys... We gave them a look. And when the dude walked away, we came over and we took them from them, usually. They going to go ahead and like, yo... Before you know, they're going to put their rap on to that girl, influence them, taking that girl away from the guy. So you saw this happen? I was singing this. You, you Behind the turntable. Well, I'm on the set, and I'm watching on the side. I said, yo, what these guys is doing? And, but right. they was just kept on bow guarding, Right. you know? If some dude wanted to stop one of them, he had to go through all of them. Chris, Daryl, and their friends. They all had each other's back. That's how deep they rolled. They were becoming a real crew. And what does every classic crew need? A name. It was the paid and full posse from Brooklyn, the supreme team from Queens. But Chris, Daryl, and their boys, they were nameless. Until one night, when Red Alert came up with something. 
every time they took over on another person, they say, oh, we just violated him. Right. Red said, you know what? Y'all always violating. You know what? From now on, y'all violators. That name stuck. And that's how it started. That skinny kid who got his bomber jacket taken from him a few years back, he'd become a young man who was not afraid to step to anyone. He would never be violated again. Violator. That's the word that comes up again and again in Chris's story. It was more than the name of his crew. It was more than a joke about a group of cocky teenagers. It became an attitude, a way of living, and it followed Chris throughout the rest of his life. Those nights weren't just about macking on girls and getting into fights. There was something happening with hip-hop. The thing that started out with DJ stealing electricity from lampposts was becoming a thing. It was in the club. It was in the streets. People were spending money to hear it. And that money was going to end up in someone's pocket. Red saw it happening, and he saw something in Chris. I sense something about Chris with his character, you know, about how he come across with a business sense. And when him and I talk, I listen to his lingo. And when I listen to his lingo, it's like, this guy got something dear. Red was right. In our next episode, Chris meets the person who could take him from hauling around records to making them go platinum, Russell Simmons. And it doesn't go exactly as planned. Maybe it was just the one night that I shouldn't have met Russell. People were still allowed to bring animals into the club and all types of crazy shit like that. Snakes and all types of stuff. They were walking around with snakes and it was crazy that night. That was Chris, by the way. You get to meet him for real in episode two. And we've got Russell, too. It's not me and Snakes. It's me and the head of fucking Sony Records. New episodes of Mogul come out every Friday. Mogul is a production of Gimlet Media and the Loudspeakers Network. This episode was produced by Eric Eddings and Meg Driscoll, with help from Isabella Kulkarni, Peter Bresnan, and Jonathan Mena. Our senior producer is Matthew Nelson. He's the guy with the Scottish accent you've heard asking a couple of questions. Our editors are Lynn Levy, Caitlin Kenny, and Chris Morrow. Our fact checker is Michelle Harris. Sound design and mixing by Haley Shaw. Music direction by Matthew Bowl. This episode was scored by Prince Paul and Don Newkirk, with additional music by Open Mike Eagle, Haley Shaw, and Bobby Lord. And a big thanks to Victoria Barner and Caitlin Delena for all of their help behind the scenes. If you like what we're doing here, please go rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It's a great way to help new people find out about the show. Come on, B. Do it for the culture. You got internets? You got Twitter? Follow us for all of the latest news and a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the show. Our handle is at mogul. Until next time, Continue to raise the bar.